and came under criticism by his superiors for his energies. And uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about what one goes through when you're employed by the government and you become interested in this phenomena and you begin to hit pay dirt with it. So with that small preamble, if I may introduce my friend Clifford Stone from the Missile Test Center from Roswell, New Mexico. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. For those who don't know me, I'm Clifford Stone. I just recently retired from the U.S. Army. I have had an interest in UFOs since the age of about seven years old when I first saw what I consider to be a UFO. It was on a uh, bright summer morning. I was going to go over, visit with a friend of mine, and we were going to go out and play a game of baseball. I heard the object making a whirling sound before I tried to find out where the noise was coming from. I looked up over a, uh, a factory house in back of where my friend lived that appeared to be the direction from which the noise was coming and I noticed a white opaque disc flying over the warehouse directly overhead and over my friend's house. From that day on, I became convinced there was something to the UFO phenomenon. I entered into the military and I had a pretty favorable career until my assignment to Roswell, New Mexico. Once I was assigned to Roswell, New Mexico, I was asked to give a talk on UFOs. I gave that talk at the uh, Roswell Public uh, Library to a group of people who had an interest in the phenomenon. Several of the people came forth and started to talk about the Roswell crash, which, remember, having an interest in UFOs, you probably would find it very difficult to believe that uh, I wasn't really interested in crash, a crash disc at Roswell. Uh, interested, but not so interested that I want to do any research. To start my uh, talk off, I guess the best thing for me to do is to go back to where I was assigned prior to going to Roswell. I was assigned to Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi. I had been to that assignment for approximately two and a half, three years. Uh, we got top heavy with people and uh, with my grade, my MOS, Military uh, Occupational Specialty, uh, the job we did in the military. So I requested to go overseas. I found in the uh, military newspaper, what we call the Army Times, a uh, request from personnel operations requesting people of my uh, rank and with my military occupational specialty to volunteer to go to the Sinide. I called uh, the Pentagon, the Office of Personnel Operation, and I requested that they go ahead and consider me a candidate for volunteering to go. They told me, fine, you're accepted, submit your paperwork. Well, I went ahead, I put in a form, we call it a DA Form 4187, Request for Personal Action to go overseas. A couple of days later, in the middle of the night, I get a call from the Pentagon. I'm told, well, you're not going overseas right now. We need you someplace else. You're going to Roswell, New Mexico. I couldn't figure out what was at Roswell, New Mexico. I knew we didn't have any Army posts there, and I knew we didn't have any ar active uh, uh, Air Force Base where there might be an Army detachment. I called the Pentagon back up and I talked to my assignments manager. I says, where are you guys sending me? We're sending you to Roswell, New Mexico. I says, well, what's there? We don't know, but we'll find something for you there. Well, there's what they call the New Mexico Military Institute. It's a junior college and you can get a commission there with the United States Army in two years. So that's where they were going to send me. When I finally made it to Roswell, uh, I liked the people there. I liked the people that I was working with. Uh, 
wasn't no real problems. Then I gave my talk on UFOs. Then people started to talk to me. Then there was a document that surfaced uh, dealing with an alleged crash of a UFO up around the Dulce area. Then we started to hear rumors about uh, bases, underground bases in the Dulce area. Then I recalled a document that I didn't put much credit in. We call it the Snowbird document. It's a one-page document with the first couple of paragraphs that had been uh, blotted out and some of the pro words, which we'd call code, code words in the Army, being blotted out, which referred to uh, us establishing contact with uh, various groups of aliens, that we had a landing at Holloman Air Force Base on uh, April 24th, 1964. Uh, we were test flying a recovered UFO at somewheres in Nevada. So I decided to ask questions of this, of this document. Now, keep in mind, I wasn't asking the military to confirm the document as being valid. To be sure, I asked them to confirm the document as a valid document or to repudiate it as not being a valid document. Simple task. If they don't believe in UFOs, just tell me the document's bogus. They would do neither. They would not disavow the document, nor would they go ahead and confirm it as a valid document. I solicited the assistance of uh, Senator Pete Domenici, one of the senators there in the, uh, the senior senator in the state of uh, New Mexico. His office went in and asked the uh, National Security Agency at my request for their thoughts on that document. Something very interesting happened. The NSA telephoned the person who was working uh, on my request there at the Senator's Washington, D.C. office and told this individual that my letters dealt with what they were referring to as national security policy, and they wanted me to rewrite my letter. Well, being a soldier, no problem, right? I'll rewrite my letter. You tell me what you want me to take out of it, and I'll take it out and I'll rewrite it. Now, they had a problem with this. It seems like if they told me what to take out, they, then I would now know what the matter of national security policy was. Remember this letter, because we'll come back to it toward the end of my uh, talk here. After I went ahead and told them if they were not going to go ahead and tell me what they wanted to take out, then my letter stood. They finally came back with a letter, not wanting to answer any of my questions on what we call the Snowbird document, but they did admit to the existence of a Project Aquarius, stating that it had nothing to do with UFOs. Well, I went back to the senator and asked for more information. In the interim, a friend of mine who had an interest in UFOs too had taken a bunch of my documents dealing with UFOs and he went to the local newspaper. The newspaper reporter that he talked to was a gentleman by the name of Steve Stein. Mr. Stein ran the article, but he wanted to talk to me. I'm away on an ROTC uh, assignment at uh, what we call summer camp, the advanced course. They have to get, the, uh, the cadets have to get their advanced course before they can be commissioned. While I'm there, I get the call at my hotel room. I told Mr. Stein that I would prefer not to discuss anything about my activities concerning UFOs until I got back there. And then I would go ahead and I would get permission from my command, which, by the way, by this time I had been directed that I would get permission from my command before I talked to anybody about UFOs and would be more than happy to talk to him uh, within the established guidelines. The end result was he ran the story telling where I was at, and it's important that you remember that he used my name and the fact that I was in the military and that I was at, as he referred it to, as a special camp, which was the advanced camp for ROTC there at uh, Fort uh, Raleigh in uh, Kansas. 
The uh, day before, this is crucial to remember, the, the news story ran on the uh, 21st of June, 1987. My executive officer, who was upset that I had not, as he said, followed orders, called me on June 20th, 1987, and said, I read your story in the newspaper. Well, since it wasn't my story, he had one over me because I had no knowledge that that news story was going to even be ran. My friend, when it did come out the next day, did send me a copy of it. Nothing more was mentioned while I was there at camp. I got back to my unit, and I went in to report into my unit. I find that there is a notice stating they needed some replacements. Among those people needing replacements was Sergeant First Class Clifford E. Stone. It seemed like I had decided that I was going to retire in August of 1988, roughly 11 months away. I went up and I asked the executive officer, what's this all about? He says, well, in case you decide to retire. So I said, okay, sir, that's fine. Only they wasn't stating was going to or might. They were asking for a replacement. Later on, a friend of mine brought in a copy of the newspaper article that appeared on June 21st, 1987, in the local news. Attached to that was a handwritten note. And I have this handwritten note in here if anyone wants to see it. By the way, this information that's right here is the files, the files pertaining to my case that I have retrieved from 4th ROTC Region, 3rd ROTC Region, Department of the Army Inspector General Office, uh, the Public Affairs Office at Department of the Army. But that right there is only about one thirtieth of the documentation that there was on my case, a case which the Department Inspector General told the news media when they found out about it, we may neither deny nor confirm the existence or non-existence of any ongoing investigation concerning Sergeant Stone's allocations. But the, this written note stipulated Major F, that was my immediate supervisor who was the adjutant, thought you would like for me to save this for you. When does SFC Stone reach the 20 year mark? The earliest time at which I could retire. Signed by Lieutenant Colonel S, the executive officer. Well, I went ahead and kept that, but by now I knew something was in the mill to get me out of the military. On the 15th of October, 1987, I am no, uh, as I come back from lunch, I am directed to report to the executive officer. The executive officer had me come in and my immediate supervisor, which I have to use initials here as opposed to names, but it was Major F that followed me in. And I remember to this day the exact quote of that conversation. He turned to Major F and he says, do you want to tell him who we just received a call from, or do you want me to tell him? Then he turned to me, and he said, you just received, uh, Major F just received a call while you were out to lunch from Senator Domenici's office. Do you want to tell me what that call's about, Sarge? I explained to him, well, sir, I believe it's probably about my interest in UFOs and about me trying to get some information whether or not we have recovered UFOs, and if so, if it's still ongoing. At this time, my executive officer called my attention to a policy letter we'd put out, which dealt specifically with policies that went on within the performance of our official functions in supporting ROTC, the Reserve Officer Training Corps. I did not think it applied to me doing my own private research into UFOs. He immediately advised me that I would receive an Article 15, the next, an Article 15 is, by the way, non-judicial punishment. It's where an officer may impose punishment on you if you wish to accept it in lieu of a court-martial. In other words, he doesn't have to prove his case against you. It's more like a fine. 
and you're pleading null contender. I told him he'd have to court-martial me. He says, well, that letter's a lawful order. He says, you will not, one, talk to any news media without first coming, let us knowing what you're going to talk about and getting our permission. Two, you will not talk to any group or you will not contact any UFO researchers without first coming and letting us know what you are going to be saying and us approving it prior to you doing it. And three, you will not correspond with any member of the United States Senate, the White House, and oh, by the way, I did write a couple letters to the President asking the same information. I felt that was my right. But now all these rights had been taken away, taken away from me. These rights that were protected by law and specifically had a law enacted by Congress to protect those rights of service members because by virtue of being in the military, we have a specific set of laws that are different for us, more strenuous for us that are in the military than what you are in civilian life. I chose to consider that lawful order illegal. I continued to write to, news, uh, to the news media. I continued to go ahead and query the government about the validity of recovery programs. Uh, I continued to uh, go ahead and hold my lectures. Eventually, this was found out. On the 27th of October, I was uh, called in and informed that uh, I would go ahead and be sent up to uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, to the mental health facility there to undergo a psychological evaluation due to my interest in UFOs. This was brought about because I talked to the colonel who wanted to know what I was doing and I wasn't talking to him. So he directed me after the end of the duty day and everyone else was gone, he told me, you will come into my office, you will sit down in front of my desk, and you will tell me everything you know about this UFO situation. So I didn't want to do that, but I had no recourse. I went on in, I sat down in front of his desk, I smoked cigars at that time, I still enjoy a cigar occasionally. I asked him if he mind if I'd go ahead and light up a cigar. He said, sure, go ahead. I lit it up and I says, would you like to call your wife, sir? He says, why would I want to call my wife? Because, sir, if you're waiting for me to tell you everything I know, you're going to have a long wait because I don't feel I have to tell you anything about my private activities. Therefore, he jumped up, was very unhappy with me, and he told me, well, you're still going to see, or you're still going for psychological evaluation. I told him that was fine with me. I wanted to talk to a uh, legal advisor to find out what the situation was because I told him of my suspicions at that time they were trying to force my retirement. They were kind enough to set me up with a interview with a JAG officer at Fort Bliss, Texas. Now, this is prior for, for me going to uh, getting the psychological evaluation. So here's a lawyer I'm supposed to go to see. It's supposed to be privileged communication, lawyer-client uh, communication. Would you believe that my command had arranged through a colonel at Fort Bliss who was in charge of the JAG section there to get feedback on everything that my lawyer talked to me about? Now, you're not going to find out who Martin is, but you're going to hear me referring to him a whole lot. Suffice it that he was just a close friend during this time in a position that could help. Martin contacted me that night, and he says, you know, on the date that you're supposed to go to Fort Bliss, don't go. You have an appointment at White Sands with a lawyer at 11.15. Well, I went to White Sands. When I went to White Sands to see the lawyer there, 
my command was not aware of it. They thought I was going to Fort Bliss. Ladies and gentlemen, when I got back to my unit, my desk had been cleared out. I was sent down to a office in, a, or should I say, a room that had a desk, a telephone, and a chair with absolutely no duties in the basement. I was to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning to 12 noon. From 12 noon to 1 o'clock, I could go to lunch. From 1 o'clock to 5.30, I would be in that office doing absolutely nothing. As I reported it in the newspaper, and they took some offense to it, and I enjoyed what I said, and I had a good laugh about it, too. I was being paid $2,300 a month to smoke cigars, drink coffee, and sweep floors, if you think, take into consideration sweeping the floor in that one little room. But that was total isolationism with me. My command, no one in my command, was to have anything to do with me. But they were going to court march me because I didn't see uh, JAG like I was supposed to. And they decided, since I hadn't talked to JAG, and I hadn't submitted my retirement papers like they had been trying to pressure me to do, it was time to go ahead and force uh, me to do something. Uh, so they went ahead and relieved me of duty. He found out later on that I really did talk to a JAG officer. But then they do this page up, they send me to go to see a psychologist, a sergeant who was a good friend of mine, Sergeant Major Mims, I'll mention him. He didn't want to do it, but he actually had to go over and he had to get a gun, uh, a 45 caliber pistol. He had to draw 21 rounds of ammunition. He had to strap on that gun and he had to take me under arms to go see the people at mental health. Now I got to mental health, and when I got there, I noticed that there were six or seven uh, other NCOs there. Anyhow, I finally got in to see the psychologist. The paperwork they had there stated that I was bothering the President of the United States, I was bothering members of Congress, I was bothering other DOD agencies because I was requesting information on UFOs. Now, I wasn't supposed to have seen this paperwork, but I got by with a little help from my friends who sent me copies of it from uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. So I already knew what it was. I had two other psychologists who were friends of mine who had interest in UFOs who didn't think that I was uh, crazy at all, who felt that I had a right to ask these questions. The psychologist went ahead and briefed me quite well. When you get there, they're going to ask you if you want a cup of coffee. Do you want to smoke? This is to gain your confidence and also to monitor your reactions because there's certain uh, types of uh, information they're going to be able to tell you're nervous, your uh, reaction to how you smoke, things of this sort. So he told me well, uh, all these things that I didn't need to do. So when I got in there to see the psychologist, I went and sa uh, sat down. He says, do you know why you're here? I says, yes, sir. You're supposed to find me mentally unfit for further service in the United States Army. No, no, no. I says, look, sir, that's what you're supposed to find. I says, that sealed letter there, here's a copy of it. He got very unhappy that I had it. I was not supposed to have that. So after I gave him a copy, I says, here's the sealed letter I'm supposed to give you. And it essentially said the same thing, only my work had deteriorated and uh, I was no longer taking care of my troops. I was working full time as a uh, UFO researcher at government expense, according to my command. So I told him, I said, if I'm not, you're, not, you're, you're supposed to ask me if I want a cup of coffee. I'm not supposed to accept it. You're supposed to ask me if I'd like to light up a cigar. Uh, cigar. I'm not supposed to do that. But, sir, if you'll give me a cup of coffee and let me light up this cigar, I'll, I'll level with you about my interest in UFOs. So we went ahead and talked. After we went ahead and talked, he did give me a battery of tests. He told me that these tests was for my benefit. He says, if we simply send you back up there, you will be coming right back down to see somebody else. 
so let us give you these tests. They gave me the test. Apparently, I passed him. He uh, called me back in after I'd taken the test, and he says, you have eccentric ideals, but you're not crazy. So he went ahead and he marked off on the form. Now, there's a little uh, part on the form that asks for uh, the individual's mentality. He marked me as being bright. Starting from the left to the right, right, the highest point was bright. So he marked that. Uh, they called my, and remember this because this gets to be pretty crucial. Uh, he called in my sergeant major, which keep in mind my sergeant major didn't want to take me under arms up to see these people anyhow. He called him, his uh, clinic OIC, an, a major, and they proceeded to jump on my sergeant major as to this was absolutely ridiculous bringing this man up here under arms. This was absolutely ridiculous bringing this man up here, period. But they had to mark something down there because I had developed ulcers, I developed bleeding ulcers, I couldn't sleep at night. I can't figure out why this was the case, but I couldn't do any of this, right? Anyhow, they marked down there that I had uh, uh, the, the problems with uh, the job, that there was uh, difficulties with the situation of the stress that was on the job. I think they called it uh, occupational stress. Anyhow, that's all they had marked down there. My executive officer took offense to that and called them up and said, this guy's crazy. Why didn't you find something wrong with him? Well, he said, well, we didn't find anything wrong with him, and he's not crazy. He says, I don't believe in UFOs, but what he had to say I found to be of interest. She says, well, why'd you have to mark it bright on there? Why couldn't you have marked him average? And I got a big kick out of his response. He went ahead and said, well, that's as high as it went. He says, but I'll tell you what, Major, the next time you send somebody down here, do me a favor. Make sure there's something wrong with them before you do it. And above all, make sure they're not smarter than you. So I, I felt pretty good about that. My friend back in Roswell, he uh, got wind of that from one of the captains that was supporting me there. And he brought it out one of the lectures that we was talking about. Anyhow, that failed. So with that failing, they still want me out of the military. They still have me down in this room doing nothing. Now they send me to see a medical doctor. The medical doctor goes ahead and makes a determination that I might have ulcers, but it's brought on because of what's going on there uh, where I work, because of the situation of them being concerned about my activities, and he didn't want to get involved. So he referred me to go and see a doctor over at the uh, medical center there at uh, El Paso. I saw the doctor there. After I completed seeing the doctor there, I went back, explained to uh, the doctor that sent me over there, well, here's what he's saying. He's saying, I, yeah, I got ulcers. It's a result of occupational stress. He says, good. He says, now you can go back to your unit. Thank you, sir. So I went back to my unit. My unit then tried to convince me that I was not medically qualified to stay on active duty. And I said, well, I guess I'm going to stay on active duty. My commander then told me, I can't order you to retire, or let me rephrase that. My executive officer then told me, I cannot order you to retire, but I can ensure you're never promoted again, which would essentially uh, force me out anyhow because I'd have been brought about, that would have been brought about by uh, what we call rift, reduction in force. If you get, uh, to the point you're in a non-promotable status, then you're removed from service. I would have still been able to retire, so that you, they didn't want to hurt me, you know, they wanted me to be able to retire. Anyhow, when he told me this, I went ahead and I decided that I was going to fight back, but I wasn't for sure how I was going to fight back. And they hadn't really done anything to ensure I wouldn't be promoted. It was just as uh, one of the investigators who did the 15-6 uh, investigation said it was through 
uh, uh, mine games, and I think in the larger report they said mine space games. Anyhow, they went ahead and would have me do demeaning things, things of this sort, uh, directed my command to stay clear of me. No one was to have anything to do with me. Then it came time for an EER. That's called an enlisted evaluation report. They went ahead, did the enlisted evaluation report, then found out it had to be a relief for calls as opposed to an annual report. So they tried to backdate it to make it appear that I had been uh, relieved months before I had, or to make it appear that I had signed that months before I had been, re uh, before I had actually signed it. I signed it in March of 88. Uh, they wanted to appear that I was relieved in March of 88 and signed the report at that time. They had a hard time processing that report. They had to do it five different times. Now I find out that I could go ahead and talk to the media. The reason I find out I can go talk to the media, and this is crucial, and I can't go into, to it, into it too much, I'm assigned to an ROTC assignment. When I left uh, the air base there at Keesler, my security clearance was pulled. I didn't need a security clearance because of the Walker affair. If you don't need a security clearance, you don't have a security clearance. It's administratively pulled until you need it again. Unknown to me, I was given a security clearance while I was assigned to uh, the ROTC assignment there at New Mexico Military Institute. I wasn't aware that they gave me that clearance. It was under the Nuclear Assurity Program. And surely I didn't need a clearance for that while I was there. But it was an active clearance. Well, when I was first got assigned, 17 days after my assignment, they gave me this clearance. After just a week prior pulling a clearance that was much higher. Also, they did it under emergency conditions. They based it on paperwork that was 17 years old. I was informed that I couldn't talk to the media about what was happening to me because of the security clearance. I would be breaching security if I talked. Well, they administratively pulled that clearance. So I talked to the newspaper, to the El Paso Times, as to what was going on with me what was happening. I was immediately called in by my executive officer and our security officer, told that I had just breached security because we were under a gag order from Department of the Army Inspector General. I said, that's impossible. The security clearance isn't there. You cannot put me under a gag order when it isn't there. Three, or three days later, the gag order was, or the security clearance was back in place. They went ahead to make sure that I had it there, also to make sure that, it, that the paperwork was there in my file reflecting the security clearance. Also, they wanted to make sure that I had uh, the uh, knowledge that it was supposed to have been all the way back to uh, 13 days before my assignment to there. Anyhow, I went ahead and I decided I would talk to anybody and everyone who would listen to what was going on there. Department of the Army was not following suit on anything that I had requested. The DAIG found out that uh, some of the things, I wrote to them and told them what was going on with me. Uh, they asked JAG whether a command could impose the restrictions that they had reposed on me. JAG went ahead and told them, no, as a matter of fact, anybody imposing, any commander imposing those types of restrictions on an individual should be court-martialed. Bottom line, Department of the Army Inspector General did not want to court-martial three general officers. I'm sorry, three field grade officers. 
I continued to try to get the DAIG, to see, the Department of the Army Inspector General, to see my side of what was happening to me. They finally decided they were going to move me, that once they removed me, that would resolve the problem. I told them, no, I won't, move, I won't be removed. I submitted my request for retirement at that time. It's crucial you remember that in February 1988, I submitted my request for retirement for February 1989. The DAIG continued to do some research, but they were not going to find in my favor. General Brown from 4th ROTC region then saw some of the paperwork that I had submitted, and he decided there was something uh, critically wrong. He directed that there be a 15-6 investigation to determine what was happening there. The end result was, was that uh, there were three members of my command who were relieved of duty for what they had done to me. I was reinstated into my act or into my uh, duties that I had prior to all this happen. And also they gave me a meritorious service medal. First time in history, first time in the history of the United States Army that a person had been relieved of duty and reinstated back into those duties and still got a meritorious service medal. That's one of the higher peacetime awards that an enlisted person can get. So I went ahead and I says, well, this is great, but I had submitted retirement papers. Well, DAIG called me up and asked me to request those be drawn, uh, requested that I request those to be withdrawn. So I went ahead and I submitted my request. There was an exchange of letters that day. I got a letter of warning. They got my request for uh, requesting that they withdraw my retirement, or my retirement papers. Letter of warning. Letter of warning stated that I'd never talked to anybody, you people out there, about what happened there. I would not tell you that the Army got concerned that uh, I was asking questions. And I, until December 1989, I honestly thought the Army was concerned about my asking about the Snowbird document. They wasn't concerned about that document. They were concerned because I was asking about crashed recoveries, the recovery of objects of unknown origin. They were concerned because I had started to ask for information dealing with Operation, uh, Moon, or Operation Blue Fly and Project Moondust. In 1978, they released a lot of information but that information alluded to it being U.S. space debris. Project Moondust was set up and established as the overall exploitation program for the Air Force for the recovery of only two items, ladies and gentlemen. The recovery of non-U.S. space objects are objects of unknown origin. The teams that are sent out to recover those, the teams are known as Operation Blue Fly. They consist of between three to 15 members. Anyhow, what I'd like to do is read to you the uh, letter that General Prather uh, sent to Department of the Army requesting that my EER be pulled, the enlisted evaluation report, uh, and that this letter be put in its place. Department of the Army refused to pull that EER even after getting this letter. As a matter of fact, after they put it into my records, it somehow mysteriously disappeared from my records. On uh, our St. Louis, our records are maintained on what we call microfish. It's a little piece of film about four inches by two and a half inches. Your entire military record's on that. I have a copy of my microfish where it's on that. On an, the one that they presently have, it's taken off. It's not on there. Somebody had to remove those documents from that microfish, or they would still have been there. They had to have been physically removed.
in an effort to give you a better in insight as to what the final outcome was of the investigation by my command, which Department of the Army would not act upon, I want to read to you the letter that's signed by General Prather so you can have a better understanding. There's a much larger report than this. There's a seven-page report, which I wasn't supposed to know about. But as a result of this seven-page report, an on-site investigation by a colonel at the direction of General Brown, who was the 4th ROTC Region Commander. This was the outcome of that investigation. Findings. Sergeant First Class Clifford E. Stone was assigned to the New Mexico Military Institute on 30 May 1985. SFC Stone was relieved of duty in January 1988, and a report was rendered at that time. Now, it wasn't January that I was relieved. It was October but it's crucial to make it sound like it was January because there had been three months elapsed time and the report had not been filed. The relief of, of SFC Stone was not justified because of insufficient substantiation of inefficiency and unreliability. Files supporting the relief do not provide sufficient evidence of prerequisite counseling or documentation to indicate a chronic existence of performance deficiency. The relief of the administration action was significantly flawed as a result of the incorrect preparation of five versions of the relief EER with date of the report was date the report was signed, what type of the report it was intended for, whether an annual or relief for cause. SFC Stone's relief was probably the result of a failed attempt to pressure him to retire early. The XO end endorser overreacted to SFC Stone's UFO interests and congressional contact, and in so doing, exhibited intolerance and bias against him. Conclusions. SFC Stone's relief appears highly questionable in light of the sudden de de degradation of his performance so soon after his ratings as professional and excellent and an un unquestionable asset to this unit. The documentation of performance-oriented counseling, close supervision by rater and endorser, the evidence of professional guidance is conspicuously lacking. The Raider and Endorser mishandled SFC Stone in response that would appear to be relatively minor uh, professional failings the NCO may have exhibited. The relief, for cause, the relief for cause appears inappropriate given the nature limited scope and short duration of the individual's misdeeds. The EER for the period 8702 through 88, 8710, 8801 appears to be singular, unique examples of administrative mishandling. Changes were made to cover up errors and hide the fact that the first report was submitted late. Reconstruction of events based on individual MFRs strongly suggest action against SFC Stone was not originally intended as relief, but merely as a means to conveniently and, qu and quickly eliminate him from the service. There is evidence that the XO attempted to form a concoctive reconstructing through the use of pressure, intimidation, and insinuation. The impro improprieties already noted generate strong suspicion that the narrative of the report, along with supporting documentation, was fabricated after the fact to substantiate the preconceived course of action already set into motion. The recommendations, now remember the recommendations because I've got something I want to state about these. Because of the circumstances of this case, the commander's inquiry format appears to be the most appropriate means to correct the apparent injustice done to the soldier. Recommend that action be taken to void the relief for cause EER 8702-8801, enclosure two, from SFC's Stone's official military personnel file. The report is found to be an, act, an inaccurate rating by the Raider and Endorser and is prejudicial to the rated NCO's military career. Both Raider and Endorser were relieved later, and this raises a question of the validity of the report rendered. The end, res the end result was, upon my departure from the Institute, I don't have the award, but I have a copy of it here. I received what's known as Meritorious Service Medal. It's one of the highest awards you can get as an enlisted man during peacetime. It also covers the period of uh, relief. The, 
Department of the Army went ahead and sent the paperwork about four file folders this thick requesting that the Department of the Army Inspector General look into uh, the allocations that I made with the supporting documentation. When we requested that they do this, the D uh, DAIG said, well, we got to stay with it that nothing happened. Finally, I went ahead and I said, you're covering this up. I respectively request that you go ahead, request that uh, the uh, inspections agency does an investigation of the DIEG activities. On May, or in May of this year, I received a response from the Department of the Army Inspector General's office. I was informed that my file and my allegations would be turned over to the investigative uh, division of the Inspector General's office to see if there was any wrongdoing in the handling of my case by the Department of the Army Inspector General. This was a result of a letter I wrote to the President of the United States, President Bush. To date, my file has not been turned over for any investigation. To date, some of the files that I have requested, I have not been able to get. To date, the Department of the Army Inspector General will not explain to me why they won't turn that file over for investigation. To date, they state that there are some aspects of my investigation and my activities that involve national security. All I did was question the government holding things concerning UFOs away from the American public. All I did was ask Congress to check some what I thought was prudent questions concerning the UFO phenomena. As a result of that, my immediate command decided to go ahead and put me through basically a living hell. As a result of that, now Department of the Army will not respond. And I've gone as high as the President to ask that it be turned over. The end result of that letter to the President, which was May of 1990, was that they did write back and state, we will turn it over to the Investigations Division. And they have not done that. If you're in the military and you have an interest in UFOs, you will catch flack if you are involved in any type of uh, activity involving requesting information and your command finds out about it, you will be in for, uh, for some hard times. The very first thing they're going to do is try to tell you not to talk to anybody, keep it just low key. If you want to go ahead and buy a book on UFOs that's out in the newsstand, fine. But if you start to become active in the field, that's not fine. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is wrong. The United States government states that UFOs are not reality. The United States government states or has three conclusions. The first of that being that no UFO reported and evaluated by the United States government has any indication of, uh, has given any indication of being a threat to our national security. I don't believe that conclusion. I believe that when you have a vehicle that violates the airspace of the United States and you are unable to identify that object, then that creates a potential security uh, risk. They state that they have not been able to uh, find any information that would indicate that any object thus far investigated by the U.S. government has given any indication of being of, in, of uh, giving any indi indication of uh, advanced technology. That's not true based on the government documentation. We have records where UFOs have been fired upon 
and the UFOs took off like nothing happened. We have UFOs that have knocked out the onboard weapons systems of aircraft, the onboard radar communication systems of aircraft, and we have got uh, situations where aircraft have simply been destroyed. And when I say destroyed, I mean they're there one minute, they're gone the next. We don't have any type of weapons system to include our lasers. If you hit an aircraft with a laser, the aircraft will blow up. It will not simply cease to exist. But what I'm telling you right there, these are all in government documents. The United States government states that no UFO has given in, has, that they have investigated has given any indication of being of extraterrestrial origin. Well, if this is true, and they haven't released any recent documentation, but there have been some back in our past that would sort of indicate that they thought along those lines. But if this is true, then my questions are, if UFOs do represent a potential threat to our national security, and they do based on the government documentation, if UFOs rep are, demonstrate an advanced technology that we are not capable of replicating, and they do based on the present documentation that's been released by the United States government, and they do not originate by any nation on the face of the earth, where do they come from? I feel that I had an obligation while I was in the military to ask my government those questions. I felt that I had a right to ask my government those questions without any malice or any retribution being brought about by my command. That was not to be the case. I know it's still ongoing. I want you to know what happened to me because if you're in the military, it could happen to you. If you're a mother or father, it could happen to your children. And it should not happen. These questions have to be asked. The truth has to be told. The truth of the matter is the United States government is not telling all it knows about UFOs. It's keeping some of that information classified. If anybody in the military questions that mandate or that protocol, then they will be reckoned with accordingly. I was nervous coming up here, and I want to let you know what happened to me in the military. And I appreciate you bearing with me and staying with me all the way through this. Thank you kindly.